The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, voracious vortices of vorpatrol and vorkosigan wit and wiliness. A Jackson's Hole contract killing, conventions, caucuses, and covenants of fealty. Plus part 25 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have the first of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujol, creator of the Vorkosigan Saga and author of new entry in that series, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance was a New York Times bestseller in hardcover and is now out in trade paperback at booksellers everywhere. Lois talks to us about the great characters from the series, such as Miles Vorkosigan, Ivan Vorpatrol, and others, and fills in details on her own development into a multiple award-winning, multiple best-selling, that's the part we like, writer. And, of course, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Yeah, I have crud, Laura. Con crud. Oh, did you bring con crud back from World Con? Yes, I think uh, I think Chuck Gannon gave it to me sitting next to me at a dinner. Oh, well, I hope we don't have Dragon Con con crud merging with World Con con crud. Uh, that might create a super bug that destroys the human race and turns us all into zombies. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> yes. Well, send up the fireworks and kittens in spacesuits, Laura, because the September original titles are now at booksellers everywhere. Yay! Yep. These include Under a Graveyard Sky. Uh, this is, speaking of which, this is the start of a new uh, series by John Ringo that involves a few zombies. Also, The Undead Hordes of uh, Khan Ghoul by John F. Mertz. This one's fantasy with lots of adventure and ninja on zombie action, I believe. Yep, another zombie book. We are zombie-tastic in September. We are uh, also reissuing a couple of Robert A. Heinlein novels in one volume. This is The Man Who Sold the Moon and Orphans of the Sky. And it includes a moving tribute essay by Bain author Mark L. Van Name. Yep. And the cover is by Bob Eggleton. He's done our other Heinlein reprint titles, too, which is kind of defining a new look for the 21st century for these books. Yeah, I really like those Eggleton covers. My, I think my favorite is the one he did for Green Hills of Earth. I think that's the one that has a, a green background and a spaceship uh, mm -hmm. in the front. It's really beautiful. Uh, so, Laura, how was your Dragon Con? It was busy. We had a lot of people stopping by the booth. We gave out a lot of infected Bane tattoos. Yeah, had a great time. We have these tattoos. What first tell us what Dragon Con is for a moment. It's Nerdy Gras. It's a big party of about fifty seven thousand people dressing in costume with uh different tracks of literary programming, movie programming, T V show, actors, a masquerade, a big parade on Saturday. Oh yeah, I like that parade. It's a giant masquerade parade. It's a lot of fun. There was a lot of um uh, Royal Manticore and Navy uh, masqueraders last year. Were there again? Were they there again? Yes, the Royal Manticore and Navy was there. I saw some folks in Vorkosigan House livery as well. Wow, cool! So tell us about these tattoos. Oh, the tattoos are great. They have the Bane logo on them, and they say "Infected." So, mm -hmm. so you have a temporary tattoo, and you can show everybody you've been infected by Bane. Cool. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to give those out. Yes, if you want one of these lovely zombie bane infected tattoos, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to our contest address, P.O. Box 1188, Wake Forest, two words, North Carolina, zip code 27587, address to contest. Yeah, send them, and please send them to that special address. Uh, that would be the best way to get them quickly. 
We'll have somebody fulfilling those uh, real quickly in, at that address. Hello, intern. Ha <laughs> ha. My Worldcon. I went to Worldcon, which yes. was in San Antonio. So how was Worldcon? Tell us about Worldcon. It was pretty good. Um, this is uh, the World Science Fiction Convention. Uh, we went. Lois McMaster Bujold was nominated for uh, Hugo for Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. Um, Tony Weisskopf, our boss, was nominated for Best Editor Long Form. We didn't win. We came in a close second in each category. Um, Lois already has like a zillion, gazillion Hugos anyway. Did she wear her uh, necklace? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she had that necklace that has all the uh, the pins of all the awards she's won sort of woven into a spider-like. It's really pretty. Uh, yeah, we ate a lot of meals on the San Antonio Riverwalk. Um, saw some bullet holes in the Alamo. It was good times, good times. So we're all back at work now after our various trips to Dragon Con and World Con. We're back bringing you the best in science fiction and fantasy at Bane.com. Hallelujah. And I hope we get over this uh, con crud that we've, we've brought back as well. September new titles have exploded onto the scene anyway. So check them out at your favorite bookseller. And uh, you can find them all also at Bane.com. And now Bain Editor Emeritus Hank Davis joins me for part one of an interview with Lois McMaster Bujold. We are very pleased to have with us the creator of the Vorkosigan saga, Lois McMaster Bujold. Hello, Lois. Hi there. Thank you for inviting me on your show. Lois McMaster Bujold is the creator of one major science fiction series and two major fantasy series. Her Vorkosigan saga, featuring for the most part the adventures and misadventures of Sions and troubleshooter of Interstellar Empire, disabled, brittle bone, extremely short Miles Vorkosigan, as well as many other characters who share the Vorkosiverse, as it's sometimes called. Lois has won five Hugos and I believe three Nebulas and a bunch of other awards. More importantly to Bane and to my salary, the Vorkosigan saga has produced multiple New York Times bestsellers. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Including the 16th novel entry in the series, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, which is actually number 15 chronologically within the Vorkosigan timeline, but who's counting? Oh, a lot of people are. Yes. We can get back to that topic. <laughs> well, if you, if you do want to delve into the nitty-gritty of the Vorkosiverse, we can indulge you with a complete guide to everything in Barayar <laughs> and beyond. Uh, this is out from Bain. It's the Vorkosigan Companion. Uh, and it's co-edited, I believe, by a longtime friend of yours, Lois, uh, Lillian Stewart Carl. Mm -hmm. uh, that goes back a long way, because Lillian and I met in seventh grade when we were both about 12. Uh, and we figured out a year or so ago that that was 50 years ago, which was like an appalling number from, from both our points of view. Uh, so, yeah, Lillian and I were best friends back in, uh, back in junior high school and high school. Uh, we... Uh, shared fandoms. Uh, uh, she introduced me to archaeology and history reading, and I introduced her to science fiction and fantasy. And, and both these uh, cross-pollinizations proved to be very f fruitful for our futures. Um, and we, uh, we sort of indulged in fanfic together and did all the things that, that young people do. But this was in the uh, 1960s when there was uh, much, much less contact with other fans possible. So we were kind of uh, kind of a very isolated uh, in a very isolated little group in our in our suburban high school. Where was this, Lois? In Ohio somewhere? Yes, this was uh, Upper Arlington, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus. Uh, my father had or my parents had moved to uh, Columbus right after World War II for my dad's first postgrad job at Battelle Memorial Institute. He, he later went over to teach at Ohio State University. And Lillian's father also was a uh, professor at OSU, he was a professor of agricultural engineering. So we also had that kind of connection there. Well, there's a... Family, there's, academic family backgrounds. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of biographical material on, on you and a very good discussion of the themes and tropes and all the literary analysis one could want on the Vorkosigan stories in that Vorkosigan companion. All kind of stuff about... Also Quite about a production your, to put together. Go ahead. It's amazing. There's a lot of stuff about your pretty amazing family as well, um, including your dad, who was uh, who's a groundbreaker in uh, some kind of engineering, I believe. Not destructive. 
Reactive testing engineering was the main specialty for which he was known, uh, which I can go on about at length, but in a minute. Go ahead. <laughs> well, and I want to ask you about something else, though. Like we were, I'll, I'll take you back to the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no, no. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, in the past couple of years, I've become friends with, I think it's a, a very old friend of yours, who is Ron Miller, the artist. Uh, I was very surprised to hear that and amused. He's been doing a lot of ebook covers for us lately, and uh, he has put together an amazing uh, collection of classic science fiction uh, public domain novels that he's redone, and uh, it's just an amazing collection. We featured it. It's ebooks. Uh, we featured it on this uh, podcast before. Anyway, um, he told me about your early days in science fiction, and frankly, he backed it up with some interesting photographs. <laughs> of a young Lois McMaster. He needed models, he said. Go ahead. Well, uh, tell us about, it, it does seem you were very much a fan while you were developing as a writer. Can you tell us a little bit about your early days? Uh, gosh, going all the way back uh, to what I read in grade school, Eleanor Cameron's The Wonderful Flight to the Mushroom Planet. I mean, you know, so it, I got my got my uh, early hind line in, uh, even, at, you know, even... Uh, before junior high, I was getting into into the genre. I was graduating from horsebook. I started out with horse stories, you know, Marguerite Henry and Walter Farley and the Black Stallion and all that, and then sort of graduated science fiction a little later on. Uh, and I've read this stuff up through up through my teens. I graduated from high school and was working. I didn't go to college right away. I had worked for a uh, winter at. Uh, Lazarus, which is a department store downtown, and I was in the bookstore, working in their bookstore, and one of the fellows came in from the local science fiction group. I had no idea there was such a thing as fandom at this point, uh, other than, you know, some Star Trek fans that I had met uh, uh, through letters. Uh, so, uh, so we fell into a conversation in front of the SF section, the way you do, mm -hmm. um, and he invited me to the Central Ohio Science Fiction Society meeting, COSFAS. Uh, which was uh, then a, a young group of fans. They were very involved with putting on the early Marcons. And uh, so I trundled off to this thing, which was uh, 22 guys and me in Ron Miller's parents' basement uh, <laughs> in the late 60s. I guess it would have been about 19, uh, early 1968, I guess, or early 1967, eight, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, it, was, it was great. You know, we could talk about science fiction uh, which is like not something that uh, that I found a whole lot of uh, other people were interested in in my little world. Yeah. Ron, uh, so showed that's where me I met Ron. A, yeah, Ron showed me a picture he, he of you. He was an art student at uh, yeah, Columbus sorry. College of Art and Design, and sort of working up to his career, which he eventually came to roundaboutly. Um, his first job out of college was uh, for. Uh, an ad agency, as, as these kind of things tend to be. But then he got a break. He got a job with the Smithsonian Institute and uh, the Air and Space Museum. And that was what really gave him the chance to uh, to go after the things he was interested in. Yeah, he had a he had a, a lot of interesting guys there. Go ahead. Really cool career. He, I mean, he did like the visual design for D the Dune movie and and many other things. Now he showed me a picture of you, um, and it looked like you were wearing a Starfleet uniform. <laughs> I think that was probably an early Halloween costume recycled into uh, into a uh, science fiction costume contest, you know, which I went out and participated in as, as a fan. I think there's, there's another good picture with me holding my, my self-glued-together model of the Starship Enterprise in front of my Star Trek poster, which I painted myself with tempera paint uh, based on a, uh, I think it was a, TV guide cover because you couldn't buy this stuff you know, back in that day. You had to make it yourself. Fandom was very much a do-it-yourself operation. So that's that's a pretty amusing photo that he has somewhere in his archive. Oh, yeah. well, I've seen it too. <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> truck, he, he trucks them out whenever he can. Author picture portrait of the author as a young fan. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, skipping a few years later, uh, for those who don't know, you sold your first three novels, all three at once, I think, to Jim Bain, the founder of Bain. Um, uh, uh, let's see. It depends on how much you want to know. Uh, if we go back a ways, yeah, skip in the way back machine, uh, Sherman, uh, the, um, I had tried to write in high school and, and in college, and then kind of fallen away from it. I got married, I got a job, you know, I did other things. I read a lot for about a decade. And then once again, my friend Lillian Stewart Carl, 
but also had her kids and was home taking care of them, started to write again, uh, as, as we had done back in the day. And uh, some short stories, she was working on a novel, and she made some sales to, I think, uh, uh, Asimov's and uh, a couple of other of uh, the science fiction magazines. And I was stuck in Marion, Ohio, with two small children and no job, middle of the Reagan recession. There was nothing to be had that would pay a babysitter. Uh, for a while, as a matter of fact, I stayed home and babysat other people's kids because that was the only thing I could do. Not, not a job for me. Uh, but I looked at her, what she was doing, and thought, hey, this is something I could do, you know, at home with the kids. Um, so, uh, so I started working on a, what eventually became a novelette uh, called Dreamweaver's Dilemma, uh, which wound its way to its finish. It was, a, it was, gosh, my first, you know, well, not exactly, not my first story, but one of the first ones finished. Uh, and I sent it off to Lillian for, for some critique. And she had, uh, in the meanwhile, been out on the convention circuit and had met Patricia Reedy, a fantasy writer from Minneapolis who was about our age and who had also just made some early sales. She just sold her first novel. So Lillian uh, suggested I send my short story to Pat Reedy for critique because uh, Pat was interested in that kind of thing. Uh, she was involved with uh, critique groups up here in Minneapolis. I was in Marion, Ohio at the time, and Lillian was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so the three of us sort of fell into a round-robin writer's workshop by mail, where we would type, I would laboriously type carbon copies, because I had no computer in those days, of course, um, and send them off to Pat and Lillian, and then you know, a week or two later I would get back a letter or some of their stuff, and I would like try to critique modeling off the way they did. So it was very much modeling and learning from each other and bootstrapping each other up. So it was not... I was not writing in a vacuum exactly, but it was a small group, um, and, uh, and we really, you know, I really got by with some help, help from my friends there. So after I finished the novelette and sent it off, you know, hoping it would sell, uh, which it never did at that time, I started on the book that eventually became Shards of Honor, and I wrote that through most of 1983, uh, at the end of uh, 19. 83, I started on The Warrior's Apprentice and wrote that through most of 1984 and uh, wrote Ethan of Athos, my third novel, in 1985. And it was at the end of 1985 that the three completed books sold to Bain. So I submitted them once again. Uh, Lillian keeps turning up in my, in my story of my career. Uh, she had bet, met Betsy Mitchell, who was then senior editor at Bain at a convention and uh, told me about Bain books, which I had not heard of before and suggested that, uh, that I send The Warrior's Apprentice into them when it got freed up from its, its last uh, submission. I think it had about three or five stops before it arrived at Bain. Did and you, uh, uh, so that's how I arrived at Bain, who was also a brand-new company then. It started in 1984, I believe, or 82, at any rate, about the same time I did. Uh, so, uh, did you... Uh, did you... Uh, Three finished books at the time Jim Bain want, wanted to buy books. Did you send them out? Uh, did you send them out t when you sent them out? Did you uh, multiple submit them, or did you do the good thing and send them one at a time to each of them? Oh, I, I was good. I'm a girl, for God's sake. Um, I was good, and I sent them one at a time, and they took forever to turn around, which was fine, because then I went and worked on the next book, which is exactly what you should do. Um, so, uh, so yeah, they uh, they had assorted adventures in their in their three years of rejections. Uh, there was one that uh, I sent in and didn't get anything from my postcard of receipt, and wrote them, and and they said that the the manuscript had been received and returned, which meant not only was it rejected, but also it was lost in the mail. Both of which turned out to be untrue because several months later the manuscript turned up properly rejected this time with a letter from the editor. Uh, so it had been neither. They just were you know, too confused about their office to find the darn thing. So, uh, yeah, I did not trust those postcards of receipt after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, others went into the uh, – Ethan of Athos went in as a partial to Terry Carr, who was reading at the time for a, an Ace uh, First Novels line. Ace, I think it was. Um, and he had, like, a, a – slush pile 12 feet high and was ill, so that wasn't you know, going anywhere very fast. I tried Warrior's Apprentice uh, a couple of places, and uh, you know, one person thought it might be a YA, so I tried it on the YA uh, publisher, and they sent it back pretty quickly, uh, saying <laughs> clearly, evidently not. Uh, and then, then the next stop was Bain and the rest was history. 
So it was a very, uh, it was a very back and forth, very, uh, very frustrating period. Uh, nevertheless, I was able to turn all that energy into to creative paths and keep on writing. So that was what saved me in the end. After you made the sale of, I mean, Jim Bain just bought them all out that um, he, he wanted all of them, correct? And yeah, yeah. We had, uh, we had talked about the other two. He'd only seen the Warrior's Apprentice, but I think we discussed the other two previously. Or I had discussed it with, uh, with uh, people at Bain. And or to, talking to Jim. Were you, um, did, did you have a period where you were, uh, did you just start writing the next one, or did you have a period where, wow, I'm published, and, and then had trouble getting back to it? Oh, gosh, it was, <laughs> that was a complicated story, because there's, you know, there's the, there's the time you sell a book and turn it in, and then there's this long period until it actually hits print. Uh, so, no, you don't sit down and do nothing during that period. That would be an enormous waste. But I had, you know, I had a publisher now, and I wanted to, uh, wanted to write, uh, you know, something that he could buy. So there was some discussion, and the book I started on next, which I started on early in 1986, was my fourth novel, Falling Free, which eventually went on to win my first Nebula Award for best novel. And uh, I had actually discussed this some with Jim over the phone. Uh, because I wanted, you know, I was scratching around for an idea. I had these three books in the same universe that, you know, were potentially the kernel for a series. Uh, and I had the notion to follow up uh, Artie Mayhew, who is a character, a minor character from The Warrior's Apprentice, uh, where he would go off and find a uh, an RG ship, which he needed for his uh, jump pilot's implant uh, at, a, at a sort of interstellar junk dealer's out, out in the boonies somewhere, and uh, was sort of developing this a little bit. And Jim wasn't too interested in Artie, but he was interested in my idea of the uh, the asteroid dwellers. So sort of taking that idea and rolling it back to see, okay, where does their story start, brought me to 200 years earlier uh, with uh, the bioengineered quaddies and the story that eventually became Falling Free. So it was... Yeah, it didn't come all in a you know in a sudden rush of inspiration. It kind of came in bits and pieces and gradually you know, assembled itself into to uh, sort of the critical mass to start a novel. I believe that Falling Free was um, my first uh, encounter. I, I think it's the first thing I've ever read of yours, and uh-huh. I, I loved it. Uh, Great. Also it was... Yeah, the other uh, lucky break, well, not exactly lucky break, because you make your own luck, uh, was that it was my first analog sale as well. Uh, I had run Ethan of Athos past Stan Schmidt at Analog as a possible, you know, something they might serialize, because they were, as far as I knew, the only uh, magazine that serialized novels. And I had read, you know, I had read Analog serials back in the in the 60s. So I was reading Dune and, you know, uh, Too Many Magicians and all those great classics that uh, John W. Campbell had. So I knew that, you know, I knew how it worked. I knew, uh, you know, I had seen it as a reader. Uh, he couldn't use Ethan, but he gave me some sage advice about, you know, what he needed, what he was looking for, you know, what kind of lead times he needed. And so as a, as a thing that I did myself, I uh, submitted Falling Free to uh, Stan Schmidt at Analog, and he bought it for, for a serial. And I think that was an important uh, stepping stone in my career, because through the pages of Analog, it brought my books and my name to the attention of a lot of readers who might not have run across it, you know, as a paperback on in the bookstore. So I think that also fed into the kind of the slow build that was going on. Well, let's talk about Miles for a little bit. Uh, it, we first meet Miles in the aforementioned Warrior's Apprentice, um, mm-hmm. which came out, I believe it was 86 when it was published. Um, 86, yeah. The first three books were all published in 86 in June, August, and December. <laughs> Serially, wow. Uh, so Miles, Miles is this self doubter in general, but in the later books, he's had a lot of success. So he, with his all off kilter plans and such, and here in this first book, we see Miles with his disabilities fully in place. Mm-hmm. And um, he's also just seventeen, which is a div- disability in its own right. But uh, go ahead. No kidding. Well, so he's in despair. He hasn't done anything yet. He's in dis- he just uh, failed at a at a crucial test for the military at, um, on Bariar, mm-hmm. um, and um, and generally young and stymied, uh, and he wants to live a conventional life, but he can't. Do you remember um, how Miles came to you? Um, did he come to you as this guy who who uh, 
goes at every problem sideways to solve it? Um, or did that sort of develop in The Warrior's Apprentice as you were writing it? It developed. Miles actually came the way real people do. He came from his parents. If we go all the back, way back to my first novel, Shards of Honor, uh, which I wrote back in, uh, what was it, 83, I guess. Um, I had written that book, and sort of because it was my first novel, I didn't know how to stop. I kept going for several chapters after what eventually, when I eventually rolled back and found the ending that uh, the book currently has, because we were getting into a whole new subplots and, and other things. But I already knew uh, at the time that I wrote Charts of Honor that uh, that. Errol and Cordelia would have a son in this very patriarchal, militaristic culture who would be physically handicapped and very bright and energetic. You know, that's all I knew about him at the beginning. Um, but I had written back in 83 all the way up through the Siltoxin attack and the immediate aftermath. Uh, we hadn't quite gotten to Vordarian's revolt yet. Uh, so that was the point at which I stopped and you know, I sent the carbon copies up to my attic and forgot about it for a while. The Siltoxin uh, well, attack was about the... Miles you know, yeah. initial uh, initial gestation, as it were. Yeah. Um, the Sultoxin attack was what made Miles... Um, yeah, the Sultoxin attack uh, was what gave him his, his, his unfortunate uh, disabilities there. So, so that was already known to me uh, at the time that I started. And uh, Bathari as a character had also been developed in Shards of Honor. And Bathari and Miles were actually the two key carriers of the key characters of the Warrior's Apprentice, because the first image I had for the Warrior's Apprentice, sort of jumping ahead, you know, like 20 years after, like Dumas, uh, for the sequel, The Next Generation, uh, was the first mental vision that I had was the death of Bathari defending Miles on some shuttleport tarmac somewhere from some unknown, you know, uninvented enemy, and Miles having to, you know, having relied on this sort of crutch all his life, having to kind of for the first time walk on his own. Can you, Bathari is, um, was Miles sort of man of, he was his bodyguard, but he was also his, um, just his, his manservant. Yeah, he was kind of his everything. Uh, Bathari was assigned to Miles when Miles was born because Miles needed a bodyguard from the moment that he was born. Uh, and Bathari had earned Errol and Cordelia's trust. Bathari is an extremely complex character. Uh, not, not at all a nice guy, but, uh, but, you know, kind of when the violence hits the fan, that's the kind of guy you want on your side. Uh, he's the third guy's guy. So his, his development uh, sort of took some of the development took place in The Warrior's Apprentice as I went back to the start of that story and wrote my way into it, and everything changed as I wrote. So I don't, I don't get all my ideas on the first day. I kind of, it's a kind of a continuous flow process. Of, you know, I write a little bit, and I think a little bit, and I get other ideas. and it. Uh, so the book is always as much a revelation to me as it is to the reader. I eventually reads it. Uh, so Bathari, uh, Bathari was a key character there in, in Miles's development. So that's yeah, that's where Miles got his start. And then we got into the idea of the uh, the little white lie that goes wrong, and the uh, title, The Warrior's Apprentice, which is a pun on the Sorcerer's Apprentice, came to me fairly soon. I think it was up, up, up to about chapter five when I was getting the vision of you know, how this plot would work. That uh, every everything Miles does makes sets up the next problem, which is even worse, and he gets in deeper and deeper as he frantically uh, improvises his way uh, across his tail. So, uh, so that's how that came about. And then Bathari got further development a little later. He's the most most extensively posthumously developed character I have, because <laughs> then I went back and wrote. Uh, a couple years later, went back and wrote Barrier, which is the direct sequel to Shards of Honor, and takes those six chapters that I threw away and uses them to start and finish that tale. Hank, do you have a, did you have a, uh, a question? No, actually, she covered it. Uh, I was going to say, Bathory is a son of a bitch, but he's their son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah, and he's, he's not sane, but you know, he's controlled, mm -hmm. and it he brings in a lot of interesting questions about, you know, does justice come with a sell-by date? You know, if a person is reformed, should they still be punished for real past crimes? Um, and, and many other things, questions for which there are no clear answers. So he's, he's kind of a window into that whole yeah, set he, of uh, ethical conundrums. He, he also has that problem he's been programmed. That is the bitch? Uh, Bathory. 
uh, in my misremembering. I, I thought he was programmed. He he goes into shock after he kills. Oh somebody. yeah, yeah. Now how much? Yeah, you know, once again, how much? How much is he responsible for his actions, and how much you know, comes from people around him or manipulating him or controlling him? Yeah, he's uh, he's a, an interesting nexus of of those kinds of issues. Well, um, let's talk about form for a second. One of the great things you do with the Vorkoskin books is that you you use a variety of, of literary forms, even genres. Um, you have sort of science fiction, regency romances, science fiction mysteries, such as uh, we see in uh, Diplomatic Immunity, and, of course, straight space opera, hard science fiction. Uh, Falling Free really felt like hard science fiction to me. Oh, yeah, that was that was my analog story. It was intended to be. How does using these different forms and genres develop? Do you you say, I want to write a mystery now, or I want to write a love story, or does it come about as you're writing? It's a, it's a feedback loop, once again. You know, it's a mood thing. Um, science fiction genres, interestingly, are sort of like blood types. You know, some of them, some of them you can, some of them are universal donors, and some are universal receivers. And I think science fiction is a sort of universal receiver. It can hold everything else. You could put any other genre into science fiction and, and make some kind of story. So I tend to go for the genres that I myself have internalized because I like them and read them, you know, which would be mystery, which would be romance, science fiction, fantasy, of course, and some other things, history. Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, that's, one of the people often ask me, you know, would, would I ever run, want to write anything other than science fiction, you know, in order to do something else? But within science fiction, I can already do everything. So, you know, so that that draw is not there. Uh, that sort of creative elbow room is already uh, very large. Yeah, you can and you have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's, it's kind of the mood of the year. There will be a particular unconscious theme that's trying to get out and I will, you know, I will come up, I will have a character, I have an idea for a character, I have an idea for a world. Sometimes it starts with the characters, as it did with Miles. Uh, sometimes it starts with a setup, the way Harold and Cordelia met, that's a sort of down on the planet, you know, with, with two enemies, putative enemies having to work together um, and develop them. Um, they, uh, sometimes it starts with an idea. This is kind of rare for me. Um, Ethan of Athos, which is the story of the obstetrician from the planet with no women, um, started with the idea of the uterine replicators. And what could I do with them that you know, that I hadn't seen done in, in science fiction before that time? Uh, and thus came up with the idea of the, the planet with no women, Athos, that uh, uh, reproduces uh, with these, the aid of technological aid. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, anything can start a story, but once again, using Ethan as an example, I, I was kicking around the ideas, but it didn't really start to come together until Ethan appeared as a character. He came out of his setting. You know, what's the most quintessential Athosian? Well, it would be somebody who worked at one of these replicator centers being, as it were, technologically pregnant for his planet. And uh, once I had devised Ethan, then he started to move through the move through the setting and generate plot, and then it all sort of began. You sort of began to roll the way they do. With Miles' books, with The Warrior's Apprentice, it was, Miles was the center, and he sort of generated his own plots, which he tends to do. He had so much energy and so much need to, uh, to prove himself that he went out and found things to do. I just sort of had to wait and let them roll in. You know, I didn't have to work too hard at the plot with Miles. Just sort of aim him in the general direction of your, your setting and, and remove the leash, and he's off and running. You know, so he's... He's a fun character to work with because he's so active. Now, Leo in Falling Free is a different kind of hero. He's very methodical. He's a, he's a plotter. He's a, he's a guy who follows the rules. So I really had to manipulate the setting and the situation to get him uh, in motion as a hero. Uh, so uh, so you said, each, uh, each set of uh, character settings and plot you know, has a different mix. And each one uh, ends up sort of teaching me things that I didn't know when I started the book makes it worth right. makes it worth having written. You said somewhere that um, that you develop characters that you really like, and then you make the worst possible things happen to them. <laughs> um, this has been quoted a bit too often and a bit too bit too uh, without the proper caveats. Yeah. 
But yeah, it's kind of it, what I'm trying. What I was trying to get at with that particular uh, throwaway line was that every character has a quintessential plot. You know, the most perfect plot for that character that will most reveal him. Um, uh, Dorothy Sayers talks about this. Uh, I think in, in her book, The Mind of the Maker, which is actually about Trinitarian theology, but says a lot of things about writing along the way, uh, that if you dropped Hamlet down in Othello's plot, you you might get, you know, well, first of all, um, you, you'd probably get some kind of mystery out of it. You know, uh, you know he, uh, Hamlet would waffle around and waffle around and investigate and, you know, would eventually establish Desdemona's innocence. It would not be it would not be the tragedy that it was. If you dropped a fellow down in Hamlet's plot, he'd probably run the wicked uncle through in scene two, and that play would be <laughs> over. So that the the, the right uh, plot and the right character have to have to match. They have to uh, uh, work with each other and not against each other. So I think that was what I was trying to say. Is that the plot that you give a character should be the one that reveals what you want to reveal about that character. Uh, so if you if you put a person two people playing a chess game you might find out which was smarter but if you had two people confronted with running into a burning building to save someone you'd find out which was braver you know and possibly also which was smarter so it, uh, every plot reveals something different about the character and characters are what they do you know they develop through their plots and they become themselves by going through their stories uh, so it's as I say it's a very recursive process you have to have the right elements, so you'll come out with something. You'll come out with a mess. Well, let's uh, let's talk about Ivan. Let's turn to Captain Vorpatrol's alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a Miles book. This is a book centered on Miles' cousin, who is Ivan Vorpatrol. Mm -hmm. uh, now we meet Ivan first. We met him in the Warrior's Apprentice, the very first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was one of the many characters who walk in, sort of pop out of the prop box and walk in. They're supposed to be spear carriers, but they don't stay that way. They keep developing. <laughs> and Ivan was one of those. He originally appeared as uh, as someone to annoy Miles in the scene that I was writing, uh, which he did a very good job of. Um, but he, he he was sort of good-hearted even in that Austin, scene. Yeah, and there he was. Go ahead. He was sort of good-hearted even in that scene. He was um he he seemed like he was envying Miles even as he was uh, making fun uh, of him. Yeah, they have a very interesting uh, relationship. Once again, it's a relationship that I developed the backstory as I went. Yeah, so I learned more and more about both characters as I wrote them through the series. But, uh, but yeah, they have they have an interesting backstory. Uh, each each of them has something the other lacks. Uh, Ivan is of course physically fit, uh, you know, everything you would want in a, in a barrier and for young war lord, uh, apparently. Uh, but, of course, he lost his father uh, in the War of Bordarian's pretendership. And, and so he has this kind of truncated family situation. His mother is, is a very edgy woman in her own right. Oh, yeah. Miles has these terrific parents. He's got Errol, you know, who daunts the heck out of Ivan. Uh, it's this ultimate father figure. You know, so you have these Miles that a little bit. Uh, so each of, each of them has something that the other lacks, and, and you know the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Yeah. Well, you've—I mean—you've developed my, uh, Ivan throughout the other uh, Vorkosigan books. There, I believe there's a, even viewpoints that you've written in Miles, uh, a character. Um, Ivan was a Ivan was a very I'm sorry, Ivan. Teenager, as yeah. teenagers tend to be. Um, but you know, he grew up. He got better. Uh, we we see him in uh, Brothers in Arms as a as a very young officer. We see him also in um, Sitaganda as a young officer, so sort of slowly uh, pulling his act together. Uh, we find out more about him. We find out more backstory. We see him in action. Uh, he's a guy who wants to follow the rules because that way you don't get into trouble, which is like <laughs> matching him with Miles is the worst thing I could do to Ivan. Um, so, uh, so he, he was a fun. He was a fun character, and, and he was, uh, I think, a little underappreciated. We see him in uh, memory and in uh, in uh, mirror dance, mirror dance, and in memory, as opposite order, and uh, sort of developing once again, becoming more complex, getting older. Uh, and then we see him in uh, first time he got the viewpoint was in a civil campaign, which is a sort of late series book. Uh, and we got to see inside his head where we find out that uh, Ivan does not have hidden depths. Ivan had hidden shallows. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, still, it's what you see. It's kind of what you see is what you get guy, which is very unlike Miles. Well, why did you decide that he needed his own book? Um... Well, a lot of 
of people have been asking for it for a long time, and as usual, I ignored them. And then one day, the idea sort of dropped into my brain. Oh, I can give Ivan this situation. Aha, this is perfect. You know, sort of like the right plot for the character appeared. And all of a sudden, he had something to do uh, with this situation with uh, Tej Arqua. So, oh, yeah, let's give, him, let's give him a girlfriend who's a mafia princess. Let's you know, see what he, what he does with that. Uh, and it actually worked out quite well. That was part one of our interview with Lois McMaster Bougeau, author of Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. We'll have part two of this interview next time on the podcast, so check it out. Meanwhile, New York Times bestseller, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, is now available in trade paperback. That's the paperback that's the same size as a hardcover. And it's at booksellers everywhere, so happy reading. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has reached a truce with a long-time menace, the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on this boundary, called the Verge, and the OFS is known for its brutal tactics and support of puppet dictators. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OSS without outside aid. Aid they are receiving in the form of weapons drops by agents claiming to represent the Star Kingdom of Manticore. These agents actually serve the shadowy Mason alignment, who wish to see the Solarian League and the Star Empire at war, and a genetically engineered race of so-called supermen to take their place. In the Mobius system, rebels have shown stiff resistance in the face of a reign of terror. Following a massacre by the Presidential Guard at what is supposed to be a peaceful protest, rebels display an unexpected level of firepower thanks to modern weapons smuggled in from out of system. The government is reeling, and Mobius President Lombroso has demanded the Office of Frontier Security send military forces to help subdue a rebellion. That has been a long time coming. Here is part 25 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Well, Zydus has promised him intervention, battalions, Michael Breitbach said bitterly. The chairman of the Mobius Liberation Front stood on the balcony of what had been the flagship tower of an early Lombroso administration public housing project, which, like all Lombroso projects, had foundered in a sea of graft, kickbacks, bribery, and bare-knuckle extortion. Only one of the projected towers had ever been constructed, and even it hadn't been finished. The ten uppermost of its seventy floors were inhabitable only by the Mobius equivalent of rats, bats, and cockroaches. Not that the public housing which had been completed was all that much better when it came down to it. Now, Breitbach leaned on the balcony's rickety railing, rather recklessly, in Cayley Blanchard's opinion, and glared out across the darkened city. The fire still hadn't been completely extinguished, and the pall of smoke was underlit by lingering flames. Rather more attention had been given to putting out the fires than to removing the bodies, of course. It wasn't as if the dead were in any hurry, was it? That's confirmed, Blanchard asked, and Breitbach turned to face her, propping his elbows on the railing and leaning back against it. Yes, he said, and she nodded slowly. Although Blanchard was one of his most senior lieutenants and generally considered his heir apparent, not even she knew all or even most of his sources. Unlike most of the liberation movements, which had come and perished in the half tea century since Lombroso won the presidency, in a free, fair, and transparent election, overseen by no less an authority than that paragon of justice and fair play, the Office of Frontier Security, 
Breitbach had never cherished any illusions about the sheer scale of his task. Before he ever formed the first MLF cell, he'd spent literally years researching everything he could find about successful revolutionary movements. As a result, unlike any of the earlier movements the Presidential Guard had crushed, the MLF was a tightly compartmentalized organization which had been known to ruthlessly eliminate security threats. There were far better ways to die than to be identified by the MLF as a government informer, but there was no better way to guarantee one would die, or that one's body would end up deposited in some prominent location as a message to the guard and any other potential traitors. Do you think Verrocchio will send them? She asked after a moment. I think it's a toss-up, Breitbach said frankly. If... He broke off, then smiled a bit crookedly as Blanchard gently but firmly pulled him away from the death trap railing. He gave her a quizzical look, but he also followed the pressure of her tugging hand obediently. Better? he asked. Yep, she nodded. I'd just as soon you don't do Lombroso a favor by plumbing into your doom. She regarded him sternly until he shrugged and leaned against the frame of the door, giving access to the balcony from the vermin-ridden tower instead of the railing. Then she nodded in satisfaction. Now, you were saying about the intervention battalions? I was saying that if it's left up to Usul, and if they're available, they'll be here on the fastest transport she's got, Brightbox said, his brief amusement fading. Verrocchio would be more likely to vacillate, judging from his record, but Usul's like our own dear General Yardley, although from what I've heard, Usul's probably at least a little smarter than Yardley. Then again, I suppose it would be hard to be stupider than she is. His face twisted in familiar disgust, and Blanchard snorted harshly. It had taken Lombroso a decade or two to find someone as willing to kill everyone and let God sort them out as he was, but Olivia Yardley had been the PG's commander for over 25 T years, mostly because her personnel security, unfortunately, was too tight for the MLF to get an assassin into position to let God sort her out. On the other hand, that could be just as well. As Breitbach had just pointed out, she was scarcely a mental giant, and killing her off might simply have made room for somebody less compulsively brutal, but ultimately more dangerous. Now, if they could only get someone inside Matyas's security, especially if they could convince him that Yardley had been behind it. Hongbo is more of a wild card, Breitbach continued, pulling her back up out of her thoughts. I think he's smarter, or more likely to think things through at least, than Verrocchio but that doesn't mean a lot. Blanchard nodded again. That was another thing about Breitbach. He'd done his homework on his adversaries, and his estimates of their actions and reactions had proven accurate again and again. On balance, he continued, I think it's more likely they will send the battalions than that they won't, especially if Guernica signs on to the request, too. After what happened in the Talbot sector... They've got to be feeling nervous about the possibility of any of us getting uppity. I think Verrocchio's probably running scared, if only because of how he expects his bosses to react. And if he is frightened, he's going to be even less inclined to irritate or disappoint someone like Trifecta, which is only going to make him more likely to embrace the Iron Fist approach. Wonderful, she muttered. Actually, it's not the intervention battalions I'm most worried about, Breitbach said, and Blanchard's eyes widened in surprise. I'm more concerned about the possibility of his sending along a couple of Navy destroyers to ride herd on their transport and possibly provide a little orbital fire support. You think they'd use starship weapons on planetary targets? Blanchard couldn't hide her alarm, but Breitbach shook his head. I doubt they'd use them on any target in an urban area, if only because of how that would piss off the Lombroso toadies the city in question belongs to, and we're not going to give them any nice isolated targets out in the countryside 
where they could make big craters without pissing off Lombroso's supporters. No, I'm more worried about their managing to effectively interdict any additional arm shipments. Blanchard cocked her head, frowning in thought for a moment or two, then nodded slowly. The guards' brutal reaction to the peaceful demonstrations had surprised the MLF. Despite the general effectiveness of its penetration of the regime's middle echelons, no one in the movement had had a clue what was coming in time to even contemplate doing anything about it. In this instance, despite what had happened, that was probably a good thing, Blanchard thought. If they had known, they might have been drawn into the open into a stand-up fight with the guard too early. Their stockpile of modern weapons, like the anti-tank launchers which had taken out a total of five scorpions before they themselves were destroyed, was growing steadily, but it was nowhere near large enough yet. And if they wound up with a couple of frontier fleet destroyers in orbit around Mobius Beta, the system's capital planet, the chance of getting any additional arm shipments delivered would become virtually nil. So what do we do? she asked. For the moment, we use what happened today. Breitbach bared his teeth. One of the things you can always count on a thug for is plenty of martyrs. God knows I never would have supported anything like the demonstrations if I'd expected Yardley would react this way, but now that she has, now that she's managed to kill that many people, I think she's going to hate what Thomas and his people do with that death toll. The hard part's going to be convincing people that this time we aren't inflating the body count, really. Blanchard nodded. Thomas Maroney headed the MLF's agitprop section. There were undoubtedly many better and more stylistically refined writers in the universe, but Maroney had a gift for putting the people of Mobius's hatred and fury into words at any time. Probably that was because that hatred and that fury were so deeply his as well. There was no cynicism, no ideology in his hard-hitting anonymous posts or the graffiti slogans and cartoons with which he decorated more than one wall even in downtown Landing. There was only outrage, wrath, and passion, and the people who saw and read his messages knew it. I just hope Thomas doesn't take any chances along the way, again, she said. I do, too. Breitbach's expression tightened for just a moment, for Maroney's one weakness as a revolutionary was the very passion which made him so effective in his role of spokesman and propagandist. He wanted, needed, to be hands-on, and the guard had damned nearly caught him putting up one of his own graffiti less than three months ago. Breitbach had read him the riot act over that episode, ending by pointing out how disastrous it would have been for the Liberation Front if Lombroso's thugs had gotten their hands on a member of their central committee. Maroney had argued that they probably would have figured he was only one more rank-and-file member of the movement, or even no more than a sympathizer, but his heart hadn't really been in it. I hope he doesn't, and I don't think he will, Brightbox said now. I think I scared the crap out of him by pointing out what Matyas could get out of him in the end if anyone did figure out who he really is. Of course, I also think I'll have another little conversation with him about it before we turn him loose on this one, just to be on the safe side. In addition to anything we do here locally, though, I think it's time we sent off our own dispatch boat. If Lombroso and Zadis are running to Verrocchio, we need to do some running of our own. Dispatch boat? Blanchard didn't even try to conceal her surprise at that one. You've got access to a dispatch boat, Michael? In a manner of speaking, he said with his customary evasiveness. Then he shrugged. What the hell? If anything happens to me, you need to know about this anyway. We have a, call him a friend, on the crew of one of the local Transteller's dispatch boats. I'm not going to tell you which, even now, although I will tell you Landrum knows how to get in touch with him. Blanchard nodded again. Joseph Landrum was one of Brightbox's senior cell leaders. In fact, Landrum had been with the movement longer than Blanchard herself. 
He was one of the MLF's smoother operators, too, and she wasn't surprised Breitbach had chosen him to manage whatever interstellar communications link they'd been able to establish. Anyway, the dispatch boat in question will be leaving Mobius in the next couple of days. Breitbach continued. Doesn't have anything to do with us, but that doesn't mean we can't make use of it. Especially when, despite the current unpleasantness between the League and the Mantis, it's headed into the Talbot sector. In fact, it's heading to Spindle by way of Montana, which is certainly in the right direction, don't you think? Spindle? Blanchard repeated, then smiled. Oh, yes, she agreed. Spindle would be just fine with me, Michael. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 25, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Hank Davis, Laura Haywood, Corey, Christopher Chafani, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. A billion Vorbar Sultana voices raised in Barayar and fealty, honor, and praise to Lois McMaster Bujold, author of Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. Please join us here next time at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 